Welcome everybody to the last session of the day. Uh, so this talk is an hour and a half on modern identity management that combines both the high integrity and authenticity we usually need and expect from identity management, but also has very advanced privacy features. Okay, so we're trying to combine these two properties and do uh, identity management. So as we have seen already in this uh, school, we did, uh, I think I, see, I saw at least two talks on authentication, one more theoretical from Bart and the cryptography there, one more uh, you know, real world from, from Jim before. We did a couple of talks as well on authorization, so I just did access control. I've seen some other ones on the program as well. Okay, and Jim actually talked about authorization as well a bit earlier today. Okay, and somehow it's pretty clear, and I said so explicitly earlier, that in a traditional security system what we have is authorization. First we log in, we find out, you know, I'm George, I'm Alice, I'm whoever I am, okay? And then we use this identity as uh, a proxy to do authorization, okay? So then we're like, does Alice have the right to do X in the system? Does Alice have the right to do Y in the system, right? Uh, however, this, there is a problem with this, right? Uh, we have deployed this kind of logic of authentication then authorization throughout electronic services, okay? Without really thinking very much, we started off doing this in very closed environments where computers were used in the 70s, the 80s, and now, you know, any service works like that. But it doesn't actually map very well to what we were used to do in, in the real world, right? I mean, if, for example, you go uh, to the cinema uh, you're not expected to show any ID, uh, for most movies at least, right? I mean, you just go, you buy a ticket, and then you have that ticket. It doesn't have your name on it, right? And if you show the ticket to the, the person at the door of the, of, the ticket, of, of the room where the movie is being shown, uh, you're let in, right? I mean, there is no authentication taking part besides the fact that you have the right to go in, right? Okay, so, um, it, so it doesn't quite fit. Same thing, of course, if, if you want to actually get a drink at a bar, right? I mean, you, you go, you get a drink in the UK, they're pretty strict. They will basically try to make sure that you're 18 or over, okay? Well, traditionally, the check just takes care of that by just looking at my forming white hair, right? But if you're a bit younger, you might be required for ID. However, they don't really care about, you know, what's your name, what's your address. Right? They just care about the name, date of birth, right? I mean, that's all you need to show, you don't need in, in theory to show where you live or what your name is or anything, you, you just want to prove your date of birth. So clearly, in these examples, if we, if we actually do in the electronic world this, this thing that we're used to do of first doing very strong authentication with names, addresses, payment details, everything in there, and then as a prerequisite to accessing the services, well, from a privacy perspective, you are giving away to the service more data than is necessary, more data that was necessary historically to offer a similar service, be it you know, an online movie service or an online shopping for, for alcohol service or, or whatever. Right? So, could we actually, uh, you know, could we actually have less privacy invasive systems online, right? Um, and, just, yes? Just the, um, the, the cinema example. The? Unfortunately. Uh, which example, which example? The cinema example. Right. Uh, tickets like you can use the cinema, you're not identified. Um, there's lots of systems that cinemas are now incorporating that actually identify people in the cinema because that's yeah, yeah. the they do the anti-fraud stuff. Um, so yeah. even cinemas are starting to do where you don't know you've been identified but you are. Right, so that's actually quite interesting because people have got so used to being identified online yeah. that now we actually see to some extent a kind of privacy regression in the offline stuff yeah. uh, with more and more uh, goods and services being offered, uh, you know, as a, as a kind of subscription basis and, and things like that. And that, that's actually a very good point that, you know, as people get used to the fact that, yeah, you show identification all the time, more and more traditionally non-identification based access control stuff uh, are going that way as well. So that's a very tricky system for the, yeah. for the cinemas because, because you don't ID yourself when you go in uh, and they have a the problem with theft of uh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who is? Um, they uh, they reverse engineer the film to give you back the position where you were in the cinema, and then they have pictures of the people in the cinema, and they do facial recognition on it to get so that the person who took the uh, 
the, the, the video of the film, they know who it was, where they were, etc., etc. Interesting. So that's the way it works. So there are quite sophisticated systems going in where you're identified even though you don't know you've been identified. Right, right. No, that's, that's a good point. But it's interesting because the cinema um, anti-fraud stuff that I have seen just recognizes who you are just from the angle of the video you might have shot, actually. But yeah. Okay. So going online, we have a lot of initiatives trying to establish strong identities online. Okay. So back in the 2000s, we had the idea of having e-passports. It was all the rage. And the idea is, wouldn't it be great if we have some form of identification like nationality, name, name of birth, some pictures, some biometric, on, in an electronic form so that we can do things like prove that you're over 18 online and buy some alcohol, right? I mean, still today, this is a little bit of a tricky situation to do. Or prove online that you are residing within, let's say, Leuven to get access to the local library or to get access to the local sporting facilities that are for residents of Leuven or something like that. However, again, these kind of um, identity schemes that we see being fielded out are not really very privacy friendly in the following sense that now if you want to actually prove that you are a resident of Leuven or you want to prove your age, well, you have to actually show the full information in your e-passport uh, because basically this, is, this e-passport is not very sophisticated. It's just a list of attributes, your name, your address, your date of birth, some serial numbers. All of that signed with a regular digital signature, right? So for the digital signature to be to be uh, validated and to be actually uh, verified, you just need to give the whole lot to whatever service provider offers you the service. They can basically get access to any information they want out of that, use uh, as much as they want, and uh, give you service or not, right? You cannot selectively say, well, I want to show you that I'm older than 18, but nothing more. Or, I want to prove to you that I live in Leuven, but nothing more. And these are the kind of systems we're going to look at now. So what is the, how, how does selective disclosure credential work in comparison to that? So as for any identification scenario, and now I use identification with my cryptographer hat on, because I'm a cryptographer for this particular talk, um, we have three parties. We have the issuer, okay, that basically issues a particular identification document, Okay, that is trust by everybody else to make some assertion about you. We have the prover, which is basically the person whose attributes are being certified by the issuer. This is usually you when you're about to go and access a service. And we have a verifier, which is basically the party that needs to know that you have a certain set of attributes. Okay, so we have these three parties. And ultimately what we want is the prover, okay, namely you usually in a commercial transaction where you're in the middle, wants to convince basically the verifier, let's say a merchant or the city of Leuven, that something holds about you. You're older than 18, you live in Leuven, okay? And that this thing that holds about you is certified by the identity provider, okay? And we want some security properties around this arrangement. First of all, you shouldn't be able to lie. You shouldn't be able to say, I'm over 18, you know, the issuer, uh, agrees that I'm over 18 if this is not the case, okay? And the second thing is basically a privacy property, namely that the verifier cannot find out any more information than what the truth of the statement actually reveals, okay? That's the privacy guarantee. So, of course, if you reveal I'm older than 18, they do learn some information in the sense that you cannot be younger than 18, therefore there is something about your date of birth that does leak, but Nothing more should leak than what is uh, in the statement. Okay. And there is something much stronger than that. So this privacy property here is not just against, let's say, an issuer uh, and a verifier that, you know, are just not really caring about finding out much more about you. It should hold even if the issuer and the verifier get together, reveal to each other all the information about the interactions with all their customers, they should still not be able to tell any more information about whoever performed the transaction. Let me give an example while I show a picture. So here is the picture of what I just described, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. That's the most important picture here. So we have the issuer, we have the prover, and we have the verifier. And this is how our protocols are going to proceed. First of all, there is going to be a protocol between the prover and the issuer by which the issuer is going to give basically some credentials to the prover. Okay, this is you going to the passport office and saying, hi, I would like a passport. 
Okay, this is who I am, you know who I am, I'm your citizen, give me a passport with all my credentials in it. Okay, that's the first protocol. But now we need a second protocol by which the prover can show the verifier some of the attributes or some aspects of the attribute, or a truth statement about the attributes, okay? And the verifier is indeed convinced that these are true things about that prover on the basis of what the issuer has issued. Okay, so for example, the statement here could be I'm older than 18, or I live in Leuven, okay? So, you know, passport issuing authority, Peggy, age 25, and this is Victor, the bar staff checking that Peggy is older than 18 without finding out where Peggy lives because you, the last thing you want to do with a bouncer is give them your address, particularly if you're called Peggy. Right. However, there is a, a very important set of, of security properties. First of all, Victor is indeed convinced that this is true. We cannot forge this kind of showing protocol into proving something we don't, we don't actually have as a credential. But then here is the privacy property. The privacy property is now imagine Victor here takes all the information that has been exchanged here and puts it together with all the information that the issuer has issued, okay? Together that information should not still reveal any more attributes about Peggy. And you will be like, well, how is that possible, right? Because clearly Peggy and the issuer have some relationship and Peggy and Victor have some relationship. And the reason for that, and actually some people call these credentials anonymous credentials, and the reason for that is because when you take that protocol and when you take that protocol and you compare them, there is nothing that links the two together. So basically, Victor can have 10 people coming and showing that they're older than 18, and then the issuer can have, you know, a thousand people that basically he has issued uh, passports that show that they're older than 18, and the issuer just cannot even tell, not just what other attributes they have aside from that, cannot even tell who out of these 1,000 people were the 10 people who actually proved to Victor that they were older, older than 18, okay? And this is how basically we achieve the fact that the issuer, even if they compare notes with Victor, does not actually learn anything more because they only learn basically that this is a person that is over 18 without ever even finding out who exactly it was, okay? They're just within the set of people who are over 18. Is that cool so far? These are the properties we're looking for. Now, there are two different flavors of these credential systems that allow us to do exactly that. The first flavor is what we call one-show credentials. And these work as follows, the idea is that when you're about to go to the issuer, you kind of blind exactly what, uh, what your credential is, so the issuer doesn't exactly know what credential you have, and then you just give the credential to, as, a, as a, a prover to the verifier, okay, and you prove something about it and that's done. However, the credential is just one and the same, so if you actually try to give it again to another verifier, just the bit string would identify you. Okay? And this is why you can only use these things once, safely. All right? So, um, these credentials are actually useful for doing something quite important, which is anonymous cash. Okay? So, in the setting of anonymous cash, if you think about it, it's quite similar to the setting I have described to you here. What happens in anonymous cash is that we have an issuer, which is a bank, we have a prover, which is basically one of you that holds a coin that has been certified by a bank as being a coin. And we have a verifier, which is basically someone you're giving the coin to. You're proving that you have a coin and you're giving it to them. Okay, and that's that. And what we want from cash as a property is that the verifier, even if they collude with the bank, cannot even tell which coin was spent. Okay? if it was your coin that they issued to you or someone else's, so that all coins are the same and they provide anonymity. So single-use um, credentials are perfect for that because it means that you can get a coin out of the bank. Now this coin is anonymous. It, the, even if the bank sees it, they cannot actually tell that it was you. However, you cannot spend it more than once. Okay, you spend it once, at, at that point, this transaction doesn't leak who you are. But if you try to spend it twice or three times, that automatically um, is the same bit string, and therefore people can detect your double spending and then do something even more clever to detect who exactly you are. 
Okay, so that's actually pretty cool because using these single show credentials, we can actually implement electronic cache schemes. Very nice. Okay. However, if you were to actually implement a passport kind of technology, so if someone gave you a smart card and said this is now your electronic passport, you wouldn't want to just have single use credentials because you want to use the same card and actually do many authentication sessions, okay? Prove to many different entities different things about your credentials, okay? Without these different sessions being linked to you or within each other, okay? Because you don't want anyone basically who collates all these data in big databases in the background to know that first you went to this bar, then you went to this other bar, then you went to the library, then you did this, then you went to church, then, you know, wherever basically you need to basically show ID and then create a profile of you, a profile that even may be pseudonymous, but eventually it will be linked to who you are and if one thing is linked, then the whole thing is clear who it is from, okay? So, for these kind of schemes, we have what we call multi-show credentials. And these credentials uh, work slightly different from the first one. First of all, um, you basically issue a signature without blinding it or anything. Everybody, so the, the issuer knows what the signature it issues to you totally is. And then what you do is, when you actually show that signature as part of the showing protocol and prove that, for example, uh, it says that you're over 18 or anything like that, this is the part that you actually blind. So you prove something about the signature you have without actually revealing the signature itself, but also in a way that doesn't allow anyone to forge it. Okay, and that sounds pretty magic now, right? You have a signature, you're going to show it to someone, however, you're not really going to show the bit string. What you're going to do is you're going to run a protocol with them in such a way that they're convinced that you have a signature, it says you're over 18, it also has some other things that they learn nothing about, and they will never learn anything else about it. Not even what its bit string is or anything like that. Okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, so because we have here some integrity properties, we have here some privacy properties, and they all seem to be pulling apart in different directions. However, we can fulfill them all together at the same time. So we'll look at exactly how we build those kind of systems because they are, of course, the coolest systems and that's what I want to show you. So, basically, what is the underlying set of techniques to achieve all this, okay? So, the underlying techniques basically are what we call zero-knowledge protocols. And these are protocols that allow you to prove something about an object, like a signature or a commitment to something, okay? Without revealing anything else except for the truth of a particular statement, okay? And without being able to actually forge that statement. So, uh, an example in the physical world is if I take an envelope, I write something on a piece of paper, I put it in the envelope, I give you the envelope, and then I tell you, look, now we're gonna run a protocol, and I will convince you that I know what's in the envelope, however, you will not know what's in the envelope at all, and you will not learn anything about what's in the envelope. That sounds pretty cool, right? I mean, I give you something, I can show, I can convince you beyond doubt that I know what is the envelope, and you learn nothing, and that's that, right? And however you're convinced. So in the physical world, it's very difficult to do that. However, with maths, we can actually achieve that property, which is very interesting. So I'm going to show you how simple zero-knowledge protocols work, just to convince you it is possible to do that, because I, I would not blame you if you just have in the back of your mind, okay, this is impossible. There is a trick. He's going to trick me somewhere. There's going to be like a magic, you know, black box, a magic pixie somewhere, or, you know, th there is going to be a trick here, right? No, no, there is no trick. It's very simple protocols, and I'll show you a few just to, to get you used to the idea that this is possible. And then we'll show you a, a simple showing protocol for, you know, a credential scheme and a simple issuing protocol based on one of these magic signatures, just to, again, illustrate to you that, yeah, these things not only are not magical, but actually are quite straightforward, uh, you know, just maths that you can, you can uh, do and implement. Okay, cool. Are we all ready for this? Yeah, any questions so far on the premises? No? Okay, cool. So, those of you who came to my uh, private computations, are lucky because to some extent I have already covered uh, a few of these things uh, uh, in terms of just mathematical preliminaries, okay? So the, the very cool stuff um, with modern crypto is that 
we can do much more with cryptography than just encrypt a secret from Alice to Bob. In particular, we can basically do cryptographic operations that allow you to do private uh, computations without seeing the secrets. And this is another example where we use some slightly more fancy cryptography in order to prove to others that I know something without revealing it. All of that stuff is based on the idea that there are mathematical structures, which we call some groups, but you can think of them as just big numbers. And there are some problems that are easy to do one way and hard to do the other way. One of these mathematical structures is what we call arithmetic modulo a big prime. Now this is just like clock arithmetic. Okay, everybody is, remembers the old clocks that had 12 little points. Okay, so one hour after one o'clock is what time? One hour after one o'clock. Two, Two o'clock, yes. Three hours after 10 o'clock is what time? One, exactly, so you got it, you got it all. Okay, this is how we're going to do arithmetic. Okay, so you, we keep going around the clock. Okay, however, our clocks, to be secure, don't just have 12 notches. They have notches, a number of notches that is a huge prime. A thousand bits or two thousand bits prime, okay? So, but everything else is otherwise exactly the same. I'm telling you no lies here. I'm not putting anything under the carpet. We just basically do arithmetic by going around a big clock that has a number of notches that is just a big, big, big prime, okay? In fact, a big prime is in itself of the form QR plus one, where Q is also a large prime. So, big primes, but it's just a number and we go round and round and round and round. Okay, cool. Now, arithmetic works as you expect. Since we can do addition, we can also do multiplication. Since we can do multiplication, we can also do exponentiation just by multiplying a number many times with itself. So, 2 to the 4 is equal to 4 mod uh, uh, 5, and that is that. Okay, cool. Now, as I mentioned in my private computations talk, and you know, here it is again, there is a very interesting property of doing arithmetic in, in this way, which is the following. Given g, which is just a number between 0 and p minus 1, well, 1 and p minus 1, technically speaking, and x, which is just a big number, it is super easy and fast to compute g to the x. This is g multiplied many times with itself, and then going around and round and round that clock as many times as necessary to move as many notches as necessary, okay? Very fast to do g to the x, super fast. Everybody's happy with that? Multiplying g x times with itself, good. However, what is really interesting is that if you give you a number g and another number, which we know to be g to the x, it is difficult to find an x, okay? So just g to the x is equal to the second number, okay? So it's easy, given g and x, to get g to the x, but given g and g to the x, it's difficult to go back and get x. You look confused? I'm happy to help. Yeah? All good? All good. Okay, so one way is easy, the other way is difficult. When I say difficult, I mean mythically difficult, given what we know today about this problem. Now, there are also some other easy and difficult things to do here. Uh, for example, it is easy if uh, p, the, the number of notches we have around, is prime to calculate g to the minus c, given that we have g and c, no problem with that. Um, it is efficient if we're doing our mathematics mod p a prime to do g to the 1 divided by c, like we would do normally. Um, this is basically equivalent to the cth root of g. Okay, how many times I need to multiply? Okay, that's fine. Um, However, if the number of notches we have is not actually a prime, but the product of two primes, which is basically what RSA gets its security from, it's actually difficult to calculate g to the 1 over c. And we'll use that uh, to build our signatures in a second. However, most of the arithmetic that we do just carries intuition-wise to this field. You don't need to be scared of it. Addition works like addition. Multiplication works like multiplication. Exponentiation works like exponentiation. Logarithms don't work. That's the key thing here, right? I mean, you cannot go back from exponentiating something to what you exponentiated it with. That's the only thing that basically is, is different from the normal mathematics you're used to from uh, school. Okay, so now using this property, I will show you the most magical thing. Bart Prunell hinted at this 
uh, earlier today and he basically very clearly said that this protocol not only has this amazing property of zero knowledge but in fact it's super efficient. It was so efficient that it was chosen as part of the Canal Plus uh, identification scheme when smart cards were really pathetic little devices and they were looking for really really cheap uh, identification scheme. So this is how it works and it's called Schnorr's identification protocol because Peter Schnorr invented it. The idea is that somehow I have a secret key and of course my secret key is associated with a public key, okay? And uh, my secret key is X by convention and everybody of you knows my public key. Okay, everybody knows my public key and in particular the services I would like to identify myself with know my public key. Okay, and this is g to the x. Now, we're convinced that given g to the x, we cannot get x because that's like breaking the discrete logarithm problem, which we have said by assumption is hard in this setting. Okay, cool. And now what I'm trying to do is the following. I try to identify myself with your service, okay? And I would like to prove to you that I know the x such that if we take that x, g to the x is the public key you know for me, okay? And that would clearly show that it is me, because only I should know that key. So that's the integrity property. However, you shouldn't really learn anything from that, because if I give you, I mean, a trivial way of proving that I know this secret key is to just give it to you, right? I mean, you know my public key, which is g to the x. If I just give you x, you take g, it is public. You use it in order to compute g to the x. You compare it with the public key, and you're like, great, that's George. Great, that's George. There's no problem with that. However, now you have my secret key and you can start impersonating me to everybody else. Okay? And that is not a very good solution because I want to actually use that secret key and that public key to authenticate with many different people and they're all sure that they're talking with me and not someone else I have authenticated with. So we don't want impersonation. Okay? So somehow I absolutely need, in this case, the zero-knowledge property, namely that I can convince you that I know the x such that my public key is g to that x, okay? But without you learning anything about that x, anything at all, okay? So that you cannot go and impersonate me to other services. Isn't that the standard uh, Yes, it is in fact like a digital signature. If you think about it, it is like a digital signature because I have a signing key, I use the signing key to, to sign, then I give you the signature, and you're convinced of what? You're convinced that I know the secret key behind the public key, public verification key you know for me, but you don't learn anything. And in fact, this is how you build signatures. That's basically how you build signatures. Like DSA is a variant of the Schnorr protocol. Yeah? Cool. Okay, so how does the protocol go? Now, this is a very complicated property. Do we all agree? It's, you know, it should in theory be quite complicated to build that protocol. However, it's a simple three-step protocol. This is how it works. There is a public G and P. The P is the number of notches around the clock we do all our arithmetic. The G is just a big number that you can choose pretty much at random. And as we have said before, and I'll use the green now, Peggy knows a secret X. Victor, the verifier, knows Y, G to the X. And Peggy wants to prove to Victor that she knows that X such that the public key is g to the x, okay? But she doesn't want Victor to actually know what the x is. This is why x cannot just be sent directly. Okay, so in first instance, what Peggy does is she chooses a random w, okay? That's just a random number, no big deal. And she sends to Victor this a, which is g to the w. And we call that usually the witness. Now, first of all, let's convince ourselves this cannot possibly leak any information about x. It doesn't contain x, it's not a variable of x, it's not a function of x, it's, you know, it does not leak anything about x. So far, so good. Fine. Now, Victor sends then a challenge back to Peggy. This challenge, you know, could be any number of bits. The more the bits you know, the better. Like, let's say a 128-bit number here, back to Peggy. Okay, this is just, again, a challenge, which is just a number. And then finally, Peggy uses W 
uses the secret X, somehow you have to use the secret X, otherwise you don't prove anything about it. Huh? I mean, somehow, you know, that's the, the last message, so that's the moment where the X has to be used. You also have to use C somehow. And then you compute, Peggy actually computes a response, and this response is just a very simple computation, which is C, which is the challenge, times X, which is the secret, plus W, which is this initial witness, and that's the response. So a three-step message, witness, challenge, a uh, three-step protocol, sorry, a witness, a challenge, a response, okay? Very simple, one exponentiation here, that's the most expensive operation, which can be done even before you want to authenticate. It can be pre-computed because it's independent even from the secret, okay? And then a simple binary challenge and then just one addition and one multiplication and you're done. This protocol was very efficient when it was proposed back in late 80s, beginning of the 90s. So it's also very simple, very simple to, to explain to you uh, how it works and very difficult to convince you that it's secure. Why is that secure? Why does it work? Why is Victor now convinced that this must be Peggy because she knows X? Why? And how do we know that this doesn't leak any information about the secret X? How do we know? Okay, very simple protocol to explain, very difficult to convince ourselves that it is secure. Okay, this is why Peter Schnorr is famous. Now, first of all, let's make sure that we understand what Victor has to do here when he receives that response to convince himself that it is indeed Alice. So what, what basically Victor does is he, he takes this response and raises g to the r, and then y to the c, and then multiplies it with a. Now this sounds mysterious, right? So g is just this public value g here, r is just the response, okay? y is the public key, so he has to involve somehow the public key, otherwise he's not proving anything about um, Peggy knowing the x corresponding to the public key, so that's y is the public key. c is the challenge, and a is the very first message, namely the witness. Okay, so, so clearly Victor knows all the quantities necessary to compute this thing. Okay, we're convinced about the fact that Victor can in fact compute that. But then if you substitute R for what R is, okay, and if you substitute Y for why Y is, then you end up with having G to the C X plus W is equal to the G C X times G to the W, which is G to the C X plus W, which should hold. So that holds here if indeed Bob checks and indeed Alice has computed that correctly. So that check indeed should hold if everything here has been calculated correctly. But that doesn't quite explain why this protocol is secure. It just says that this should hold if everything was correctly computed. It doesn't convince you, hopefully, that nothing leaks about X and it doesn't really convince you that uh, basically um, Alice should have known X in order to reply here because maybe Alice has some other way of producing a witness, a challenge and a response that make this check. Uh, you know, you can maybe take another combination of addition, multiplication, whatever that will satisfy this thing, maybe. Okay, so how do we go about convincing ourselves that this is not the case and indeed both privacy and integrity hold? So let's first try to convince ourselves that a forgery is not possible. Okay, and I will just give you intuitions here about how a forgery is not possible. The idea is as follows. Forging means what? Forging means that Peggy does not know X, does not know the secret of the public key. However, she is able to convince Victor, the verifier, that the relationship that he should be checking holds. Okay, and that indeed she holds uh, X, okay? Now, we have already said before that if this relationship is to hold, somehow these things should have been computed correctly, okay? So what, what does that mean? What does that lead us to? So you remember that the first step that Alice does with, uh, sorry, not Alice, Peggy does with Victor, okay? is to actually send this witness W. Okay, G to the W, there is a, a W behind it. Now, at this point, Alice is waiting for a challenge. 
Okay, and in fact, Victor will send a challenge back to, Al to not Alice, to Peggy. Okay? Now, for Peggy to be able to have a good chance of fooling, of fooling Victor, what she should be able to do is to be able to respond to this challenge with at least two possible challenges. Okay? So what I mean by this is that if she was only able to respond to one challenge, and in fact there are 2 to the 128 possible challenges, her probability of actually finding that challenge is minimal, okay? Being sent that challenge is minimal, and the probability of cheating in that protocol would be tiny. Therefore, we shouldn't really be concerned about that. So, Peggy should be able to answer more than one challenge to have any chance of actually fooling Victor, okay? At least two challenges. But now, here is what happened if, indeed, for the same witness, if she receives at least two different challenges, she would be able to calculate the correct responses. So for the same witness, she would have to produce the response for two different challenges. We call one C1, we call the other C2. Challenge one, challenge two. Okay? So in the first possible world, she receives challenge C1 and she's able to produce R1. In the second possible world, she produces she is, she is given the challenge C2 and she produces the response R2, okay? However, if indeed she can produce these correctly, okay, then here is what happens. She, she has a W that is fixed and known to her. Sorry, I apologize. She bas we basically have two equations, okay, with a known C and a known R, these are public values of the protocol, and then we actually have two unknowns. We have X and we have W. So in theory, if Alice is able to produce two transcripts, one with C1 and one with C2, with the appropriate R1s and R2s, then what we would be able to do and what she would be able to do, Pe Peggy, is basically to solve for X and W and learn the X. And this is in effect a proof by contradiction. We started off by saying Peggy is forging the protocol, meaning that she doesn't know X. And in fact, we show that for her to be able to respond to at, at least two uh, different challenges, she in fact knows X. Proof by contradiction, it means that basically Peggy must be knowing X to start with. Okay? There is no other way to actually form these responses correctly without knowing X. Okay, good. So this is the first intuition. This is just an intuition. The, the formal argument is a bit more tough. Now, the second intuition is even uh, more um, strange, and it goes as follows. Now we try to prove that when we execute this protocol, okay, Victor, who receives all this information, does not learn anything about X, anything at all about X. And this is a very tough thing to prove, right? Because clearly, uh, he receives this response R, which is in part a function of X. So how comes he learns nothing about X? Okay? How do we even go about proving this? So here is the insight that cryptographers give us. The idea is the following. The protocol produces three messages. The witness, the challenge, the response. Three messages. Okay? Now, if I was able to produce to you triplets of messages that satisfy the, all the verification conditions of Victor, okay, without using the secret, then clearly just knowing these triplets of information doesn't actually reveal anything about the secret. Okay? So if I could just produce transcripts of the protocol that, that are fake, in effect, clearly it doesn't reveal anything about the secret. And by fake, I mean without using the actual secret. And now you should be confused. If you're not confused, you haven't been paying attention, right? Now, I will show you how to fake the transcript of this protocol, okay? And your confusion should, should remain there for a second. So here, here we go. So I need to make a fake transcript, g to the w prime, c to the prime, r to the prime, without using x, the secret without using the secret. So this is how I go about it. 
I first pick a random C and a random R, just at random, okay? And then what I do is I take the verification equation, which was G to the R equal the public key to the C prime G to the W prime, okay? That's the verification equation that Victor used to have. And I just run it backwards and I solve for G to the W prime. So I rearrange all my terms, this goes on the other side and I divide and I have g to the w prime equals g to the r prime divided by gx to the c prime for the random r prime and c prime and now I use that as my first message g to the w which is my witness, this a that I had in my first slide. So given that I fix c and I fix r, I can actually find the g to the w prime that is basically making me pass the test, and look, I have not used x anywhere. I have managed to create a g to the w prime, c prime, r prime without using x, that it looks like a fake transcript. So clearly, if now someone looks at the transcript of the protocol, since I could have faked these transcripts of the protocol, it reveals nothing about x. But, but, how is it then the case that when Victor performs this protocol with Alice, he is convinced that this is indeed Alice and Alice must have known the secret. If I can produce fake transcripts here, haven't I just convinced you that this doesn't actually use the secret and therefore I can produce fake transcripts by fixing CR and then G to the W? So how did I convince you before that this is a safe protocol and therefore you must know X in order to answer it. Is that a, no, that was not a hand, that was a stretch. Any ideas? So you create C and R, while well, he only protocol creates the C and so Yes, nearly, nearly. You're, you're, you're so close. Uh, isn't it the G, W, the, the, the first generation? Yes. Indeed. So, in order to fake the transcript, I had to violate the arrow of time, okay? I had to say, remember the protocol is three messages, first message is G to the W prime, second message is the challenge, third message is the response, and the one happens after the other. You don't first change the challenge and then expect the witness, no. You first, as a, prove, as a verifier, expect the witness and then you send the challenge and then you expect the response. So, the reason why uh, Victor is convinced that this is not a fake transcript is not because of the transcript at the end, it is because he knows that first he received the G to the W prime and then he sent the challenge. And if you do these things in this order, then it is indeed impossible to generate an R. So it is just causality, the fact that one thing happened before the other that actually convinces Victor that Alice knows X, not the transcript. The transcript itself contains no information. And this is the way in which we use this argument, at least slightly more formally, the way we use to actually prove that something is zero knowledge. Okay? That it's only causality that convinces you, my friend. It is not the actual data in the transcript. Okay? Cool. So that, if, that ins if you leave this with just this insight, you're doing great. All right, cool. What's to stop the simulator from picking zero for the challenge? Because you check, and in fact, zero for the challenge is not a problem. So you can have binary challenges, zero and one. It means, of course, that to be convinced, you need to run the protocol many times. But zero challenge is not a problem. Uh, doesn't the proof fail in this case? Oh, no, not at all, not at all. Because then you, um, here we go then you would have zero times x plus w and, you know. This is the proof of knowledge, and I'm talking about the proof of zero knowledge. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So c, g to the x to the c zero, that is just one. So that's not a problem. That's just the identity okay, element one. Proving that you know x. True, because it cancels out, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're going to use tiny little challenges, you can do that. That's not actually a problem. If you may use very tiny challenges, zero and one, for example. However, you will need to repeat this protocol many times. 
Now, I wouldn't advise you to do that. That's a little bit silly because you can use a big challenge and then be done with it, but that's not a conceptual problem. The thing would work, you would need a lot of repetitions because as a prover, you would need to be able to handle at least the zero case and the one case to have a probability greater than half to succeed. Because at any time we, we start the protocol, you don't know if you're going to have to need your X or not. Okay, and then everything else will fall from that. So that's not a problem. But you will need to repeat the protocol 100 times to be convinced. So it's a bit wasteful. You might as well use a 100-bit challenge and be done with it. Yeah? Cool. Okay, now just to tell you very quickly, what I have shown you here is an interactive version of an identification protocol, the Schnorr identification protocol. However, it is quite straightforward to turn this identification protocol into a non-interactive version. Okay, and this then becomes a signature scheme as Joan described. Okay, because what you basically have is a, a bit string that allows you to prove you know X, okay, and maybe something else in there at the same time, like a message which is public, okay? And then, you know, without revealing what this X is, so somehow everybody who has your verification key can, uh, in fact, check that you knew X, but cannot actually learn anything about your secret signature key. Okay, and the way you do that is actually pretty cute, but I'm not going to go into any details. Uh, you actually allow the prover to set the challenge, but using a one-way function, such as that first they have to actually determine what g to the w is as a first message, then you use a one-way function to determine c, and therefore even though all the computations are local to the prover, and the prover basically computes a challenge, the causality cannot be violated because of the security of hash functions. Namely, from the challenge, we cannot go back to the g to the w because hash functions are one-way. Okay, but we're not going to go into that uh, here. All right, cool. So I hope I have convinced you now that it is possible, in fact, to prove at least that you know something without revealing it to someone else. And this, you know, here is in particular a public key. Okay, you know the private part of a public key without actually revealing um, the, the private part to anyone else. Okay, however, and this is now the intuition on which much more complex credential schemes are built. In particular, this scheme that I have shown you, Schnorr identification scheme, generalizes. It generalizes really, really nicely. And in fact, it generalizes nicely because this is the, the basis on which we're going to found much more complex credential schemes. So let's look a little bit at how it generalizes. So the traditional snore just has a G and a P, P being the number of notches on my huge clock in which I do arithmetic, and we prove basically that some H, which is a public key, is G to the X. That's it, and I know the X such as that we have G to the X. Fine. This was the simple version that we just saw now. However, we can also have a kind of more general problem where instead of having a single G, I have many Gs, G1, G2, up to GL. Okay, and then instead of just having a very simple public key, I have a bigger public key, if you want to call it a public key, which is this H prime, which is constructed as G1 to the X1, G2 to the X2, G blah blah, GL to the XL. And now all of these X's are secret, okay? And Peggy, for example, would like to prove that she knows X1 all the way up to XL, such as that this H prime is indeed G1 to the X1, G2 to the X2, da da da, XL to the G to L to the XL. Okay? And of course, we don't want to reveal the X's. Huh? We don't want to reveal the X's. Or we want to reveal selectively some X's, and we'll see how to do that. And now, your imagination can already start going forward a bit, you see? What we're going to do down the line is we're going to say, well, what we're going to have is this H prime is actually going to be your passport. And these G1 to L are just public big parameters, no, no secret here, but these X's are actually going to be the attributes. This is going to be your first name, this is going to be your second name, the next one is going to be your date of birth, blah, blah, blah. And first of all, I'm going to show you how to prove that you know the attributes in your passport. And then as a second step, I will show you how to do, how to reveal some of them without revealing the others, I, so that you can choose to go to a bar and reveal what your age is, without revealing what your name is, for example. And then I will show you how to have a signature on this thing that you can also prove that you have without revealing it. 
this is the next few steps that we're going to do together and then you basically have a credential scheme because you can prove that you have a signature on the passport without revealing it, you can reveal selectively your age or your address without revealing anything else and that's what we want. You can go to a bar, you can say I am 18, I have a signature on that, I'm not going to show you anything else, let me have a drink. Okay? So first of all, how to prove that you know X1 to XL in such a way that the H that someone else knows because you've just given it to them, for example, is indeed G1 to the X1, G2 to the X2, GL to the XL, is a simple generalization of the Schnorr protocol we have seen. Now, first of all, we start with a witness that is slightly more complex than the witness we had before in that we now have L random WIs, okay, instead of a single one, and then the initial witness is G to the WI, actually this should be GI to the WI, I apologize, um, multiplied all together. So the same form that this thing is, we create another one of the same form with WIs instead of Xs, okay? And we multiply them all together, so we have G1 to the W1, G2 to the W2, all the way up to times GL to the WL. That's my new witness, okay? Second message is the challenge, same as before. Bad idea to have a binary challenge, any you know, 80 bits, 100 bit challenge is good enough. And now, the third stage is again just responses like we had before. Now before we had one secret, therefore we had one response. However, now we have one response per secret. So I compute Ri equals C, the challenge, times Xi, which is my secret that I want to actually prove knowledge of, plus Wi, okay, which is the Wi corresponding to the secret uh, I. Okay? And of course I have L responses that are sent together. Okay? So that's again doing Schnorr many times here. Okay? Instead of one response I have many. And the checking that Victor does is quite similar to what we were doing before. So before we were doing G to the R, H to the C times A. Now we actually have many Ri's here. So what we do is we produce Gi to the Ri and multiply them all together. So G1 to the R1, G2 to the R2, all the way up to Gl to the Rl. And that should be equal to Hc times A. Now it might take a little bit of um, convincing yourself that indeed Gi to the Ri becomes Gi to the Xi all multiplied together and G to the W and that indeed actually is equal to H to the C and to the A. So you will have to just go home and take the notes from online and work out a little bit that it works but it just works out because indeed Ri is Cxi plus Wi. Okay? So all of that works as before, and in fact, if I hide the big W's here and the multiple R's, it is just Schnorr, G to the W, C, R, as we had before, okay? And we just do it many times in parallel in one go. And now, instead of proving that I know G to the X, I prove that I know all the X's that produce these uh, H. Okay, cool. So basically now we have a very simple, a very simple credential a uh, showing protocol that we can run. Because what we can say is the following. These XIs are attributes, age, name, address, whatever. The credential is of the form H, G to the 1, X to the 1, G2, X to the 2, GL, X to the L. And there is a signature of an issuer on H. Now this signature will have to be a bit special, but we'll leave that to, the, to a bit later. And now what happens is that Peggy gives the credential to Victor. Victor checks somehow the signature, but now, now, Peggy only discloses some attributes, such as that my age is 28, my city is Cambridge. But she doesn't want to disclose all the other attributes. However, she wants to prove that indeed, first of all, X age and X city are part of H, and that she knows all the other attributes, but she just doesn't want to disclose them. So how does she go about doing that? Okay, well what she does is the following, she basically says I have this H which has many more attributes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the G that corresponds to the H and exponentiate it to my attribute H and the G that corresponds to the city and exponentiate it to the city and divide them out. Just divide them out. 
Because they are known, I can just divide them out. So now I'm left with another H prime that just has all the other attributes that I'm not revealing to you. Okay, this, let's say this was attribute 1 and 2, so I have from 3 all the way up to L that is still G, I, X, I. I should put the I here to avoid any misconceptions. Okay, and of course check the signature. And now basically what um, she needs to do is use the Schnorr, the extended Schnorr protocol that we have seen, since this is just a bunch of G's raised to a bunch of XI's, she can run the protocol we just saw and prove that she knows all these X's, therefore indeed the remaining X's are correct and this indeed is public and therefore if the signature checks on H, Victor is convinced that this is indeed part of the credential. Okay? Cool. Now, the magic starts. In fact, proving knowledge is one thing. Proving knowledge of the remaining things that have not been revealed is cool. Okay, so you can reveal some attributes, but not others. But in fact, we can do much more than this. And I think Martin and I have already discussed this. You can prove in particular linear relationships between secret attributes. Okay, so imagine, like crazy talk here, that in fact your meter, your, your smart meter, gives you a huge credential that represents basically as attributes all your meter readings for a month. Okay, all the meter readings. So X1 is my meter reading from 12 o'clock to 12.30 on the first day, from 12.30 to 1 on the first day, all the way how many, you know, you have for a month. Big credential. And now what you want to do, I mean, the issue is your smart meter, okay? What you want to do is that you owe your electricity company a certain amount of money. How, do, how does that amount of money is calculated? It's simple. It's basically just uh, the amount, the tariff that is applicable at any time times the amount you have computed at any particular time. So it's a linear relationship. Can you do that? Can I convince you that because my meter says I have consumed that amount of unit at each time, the total bill, which is just how much each unit cost at any time, uh, summed up altogether, leads to a particular bill? I mean, that'd be cool to do. Huh? I, mean, I could imagine some industrial applications of this. So, let's look at a simpler example because, you know, the month has many billing periods. Let's just look at three attributes and try to prove something linear about them. So imagine I have attribute x1, x2, x3, and I want to prove to you that x1 plus 2 x2 plus minus 10 x3 is equal to 13 and that x2 minus 4 x3 equals to 5. That's a weird relationship between those attributes and I want to actually prove it to you. Fine. So how can I do this using just the protocols we have seen so far? Well, first of all, I will actually do a little bit of rewriting. I will notice here that I have two equations with three unknowns, which means that I can actually rewrite things so that I have just two equations uh, with basically these three unknowns. So I rewrite it as x1 equals 2x plus 3 and x2 equals 4x3 plus 5. The only thing I have done here in order to do this is I have replaced some of the equations into other equations. Okay? That's a simple rewriting that leads me to this. Okay, in particular, I have substituted, I think, x2 into x2 here from this equation, and I reached that equation here. Okay, now, what do I do? I remember that my attribute h is just g to the x1, g to the x2, g to the x3, g to the x4, but now I have managed to rewrite my x1 and x2 in terms of the x3. Okay, so I just substitute. I just substitute directly those figures into my credential and I just rewrite. I group together everything by secret that remains and in fact the only secret that remains here is x3 and potentially an x4 that is not even involved as an attribute in this relationship. So what I have is that this h can be represented like this if these hold. If these are true then that must also be true. But if I look really carefully at this expression now again, and I rewrite it a bit, this is just h divided by some constant, so it's just a different h, which is equal to just a constant new g, which happens to be g1 to the 2, g2 to the 4, g3, to the x3, which is a secret still, and then g4 to the x4. And what, what does that look like to you? 
it just looks like just a different representation of h divided by this constant. And I can use my extended Schnorr protocol to just prove that. And if indeed it turns out that all of this works out, it must be the case that all of these credentials have this relationship amongst each other. Okay? Same thing if I had a million here different readings, I could actually just substitute my final bill into them and prove that indeed uh, my bill is correct. Okay? Without revealing how much electricity I have consumed at any time. Okay, cool. So this is basically the example just worked out. Um, it turns out that the H prime that is my new representation is just this. I redefine G1 as G1 prime and this is it. G2 as G2 prime and then I just prove that this H prime is G1 prime to the X3, G2 prime to the X4 using the protocol for the generalized Schnorr proof. And you're done. Okay, we're not going to go into crazy details about this. You can study it at home as well. It all works out. And this is in fact, again, just the worked out example so that you can convince yourself I'm not going to torture you uh, with going through the cancellations. Okay, cool. Now, so what have we got so far? We basically have a simple showing protocol. So showing any relation between these attributes proves that you know all these attributes. That's cool. Um, you can make it non-interactive. We don't need to interact between the prover and the, 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 the verifier. Okay, we can just send the verifier some stuff and they will be convinced. And it turns out that you can do more tricks. So I have shown you how to do AND as a relationship, but you can also do OR. I'm either 18 or 19, or I either live in Leuven or there, but I'm not going to tell you what. And it turns out that you can also do NOT. You know, I am not younger than uh, 18, for example, or I do not live here, or I do not have a traffic conviction on my license, which could be a credential. That could be another one. And you can, of course, do inequality. You can just say, I'm, great, I'm, I'm older than 18, instead of reve revealing your exact age. I'm not going to show you how to do this. There is just some more mathematical trickery of the same uh, form. Yep. How does this compare to the homomorphic encryption that you talked about earlier? Aha. Uh -huh. So remember in the homomorphic encryption, we had to do computations that look very much like this without knowing the secrets. Yeah. That was the idea. Here, the prover knows all the secrets. The prover knows all her attributes, all the meter readings, all the attributes in the passport, in the license, in whatever, and only tries to convince the verifier of some relationship between them. So to some extent, zero-knowledge tricks are easier to pull off because you have at least one party that knows all the secrets and just has to arrange everything to convince another party of the truth. Okay? In, in theory, if you want to do this, simply I can just say the verifier and the prover can Yes, you could. So, for example, the, the prover could create a homomorphic encryption of her age and all that stuff. The verifier then would basically run a protocol that would output an encrypted bit that says yes or no, it's bigger than 18 or not. However, that would be much more expensive because then all the computations would have to happen on the secret data. Here, it's much more efficient because the prover knows all the secret. And what do I mean by this? Imagine the, the prover basically just en encrypts her age and lets a full circuit unravel that does a comparison to see if she's older than 18. Now, every bit in here, in that circuit, is known to the prover. So instead of actually having to compute every bit in the encrypted text, what you can ask the prover to do instead is to just tell me what the bits are and prove to me that you did the NAND gates correctly. And that's a much easier problem because you don't anymore have two parties with secrets and therefore no one knows what the intermediate values are. It's just one party secrets and therefore they know the secret values in there. So there is no need to compute them secretly. You can ask them to give you the secrets so of... The, the advantage is basically that yeah. it's more efficient. Yeah, much more efficient. When I say more efficient, I mean like orders of magnitude more efficient. You can do multiplication efficiently, you can do everything efficiently here. Whereas, you remember for the computation, multiplication, ay, 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 eh? it was not trivial. All right, cool. Okay, fantastic. So, basically, I hope I have convinced you that there is a simple identification protocol, which by itself is cool, and then there is a way of expa ex uh, expanding it to actually uh, do uh, more complex credential systems and credential showing is just proving a representation of this kind of expanded Schnorr 
uh, signature in zero knowledge. Okay? And you can do linear relations between credentials, you can do or not inequality, all of that would work. So that covers this aspect of the protocol, right? So the idea is that now the prover has a credential H is G1 to the X1, G2 to the X2, blah, 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 all the way to GL, and a signature, and can convince a verifier about something here, about the attribute. However, what we haven't yet discussed is this magic signature here, because clearly, if indeed this is just a normal signature, and the issuer gives a normal signature on this H, well, the H cannot possibly change, okay? Then, when you basically give this H to the verifier, if the verifier talks to the issuer, they can say, oh, what H was that? Who was it corresponding to? Oh, that prover. Therefore, it's not anonymous anymore. This H acts as an identifier. And if basically the verifier is working with the issuer, they can deny all privacy properties here because they can just say, the verifier can say, oh, could you give me some more uh, of the attributes? Now, it's very important to, to avoid this because in many scenarios, in many scenarios, the issuer and the verifier are exactly the same party. Okay? So let's take the scenario where I implement a simple eCache scheme for UCL. Now, UCL is the university I work in. I want to be very modern. I want to implement an eCash scheme. So I would be both the issuer, I would be giving the tokens out to the students so that they can buy coffee and whatever else students buy. Okay? And then I would also be the merchant because actually they would be spending those tokens in my shop at UCL. Okay? So I would also be the verifier and therefore I will end up knowing what every student has bought with the tokens I'm giving them. Okay, which is not really the idea of electronic cash. I mean, this is okay for credit cards and all that stuff, this is how they work. But to say that something is electronic cash, it should really be like coins. I give the coins out to the students. I know that, you know, when I'm getting paid, it is someone who has a valid coin, it's not double spent, but that's that. I shouldn't actually be able to trace which student bought what where. Okay? So, it is important that the verifier and the issuer, if they work together, or even when they are the same party exactly, don't learn anything more about who did what in the system. So in order to achieve this, we use a special form of a signature that allows us to, to hide what the signature is, the exact bit string of the signature, that would allow us to identify people as being the people who were issued credentials and then the people who paid by the credentials. But at the same time, we can prove to others that it's a valid signature, right? Because it shouldn't be forgeable. I shouldn't go and pretend that I have coins or a passport if I wasn't issued one, okay? So how do we want? What do we want? We basically want to um, hide the credential so that we can use it multiple times. We want to hide that signature every time we show it. And of course, we want to prove, despite the fact that the signature is hidden, that it is a valid signature. And there is a special signature scheme that we call the CL signature scheme. Kamenisch, Lysianskaya are the authors of this that does that. And this is how it works. It's basically an RSA signature. If you know how RSA signatures work, this is your lucky day. But ultimately, there is a bit of a setup, and here there is a soup of numbers, but ultimately what happens is that we have a, a P and Q prime and N is their product. And then we just choose G1 all the way down to GL. This is the way we're going to encode our credential. And then there is a magic B and a magic C. By magic, I mean largely arbitrary random number B and C. And then my private key is the P and the Q, which factor my modulus PQ, okay? These are the big prime numbers. And then everything else is just part of the public key. All the Gs, the N, which is the product of the two primes, the magic B and the magic C arbitrary numbers are the public key. So now given this private key, I should be able to produce signatures that given the public key can be verified. That's the idea. And this is how the signature works. I take my attributes. I take, uh, sorry, I, yes, I take the secret attributes that I want to sign. I raise G1 to the X1 all the way down to GX to the XL. And I multiply it with B to the S for a random S. Okay, so this is very much looking now like the credential Okay, and then I take a C, okay, uh, which is the other arbitrary number, and divide it by this, in effect, credential. 
And then I raise it to, or I find, if you want, the eth root of that number. Now, there is something magical here, which is that if you work in a prime field, if this n was a prime, if we were doing clock arithmetic around a prime, it would be trivial for anyone to compute this. Anyone could compute that. However, we're not working in a prime anymore. n is p times q, like in RSA. So in fact, now it is difficult for someone that doesn't know p and q to compute that value because it is difficult to find eth roots anymore, which is exactly the RSA problem as well. Okay, RSA as well says it's difficult to find one divided by e here. Okay, however, because I do know, I am the signer, I do know the factorization of n, I can compute this v. And then the signature is e, v, e, s, and v. That's it. And as I said, I cannot forge it because I cannot take the eth root without knowing p and q. You'll have to believe me on this. So it's just an equation and I compute it and at the end I get e, s, and v, and that's my signature. It's a bit like RSA. In RSA, we would just stick anything we want to sign the message just in here and we would do the same thing. But however, here my message is in a little bit of a special format. There is this B which is random, there is this S which is random, there is this V which is a little bit that the RSA signature, but there is more to it. Yes? Question? Yeah, the X is the attributes. Yes, indeed, indeed. So the X's and the G's are exactly what we had before. The X's are the multiple attributes that I would like to sign. So the first one might be my, might be my name. They represent the real data of the attributes. Indeed, indeed a hash. In normal RSA, we would hash these. Here we use them if they're numerical values directly, yeah. Is that answering your question? Yeah, but doesn't it make it easy to calculate them up front? Because age is not that hard. You don't have that many different ages. Ah, yes, yes, but you see, B here hides them. So you see there is a B to the S here, okay? And this B is part of the public key, but this S is random. So even if these attributes are all binary, let's say I have two, I have one attribute that could either be zero or one. Uh, this is the most trivial case, right? So this would be either G1 to the zero, G1 to the one. It's easy to pre-compute, okay? Because B is big and S is random, this totally blinds what it is. And that actually doesn't leak information about what my attribute is. Is that answering your question to some extent? Kind of, yeah. kind of. It, was that your worry? I'm not sure. Yeah, because indeed, if, if you can recalculate those things. Yeah, it becomes easier to, to break those things as well. Okay, cool. Now, let's look at how do we verify this. So, just a reminder, just from the previous slide, this is how I calculate V, this is where S is, this is what E is, etc. fine. Okay, and my signature is E, S, V, so that this holds. So now, what do I do? What do I do? I basically note that this is very close to what my representation was before. And what I do is the following. First of all, I want to re-randomize a little bit the signature so that when I present it to the verifier, it doesn't look the same as when the issuer gave it to me. This is core to my privacy property. The signature, when I actually prove that I have it, should not look the same like when I was issued that signature. Very important, otherwise I can link them together and if I'm the same issuer and the same verifier, I can tell where you're spending your money or where you're showing your passport or whatever. We don't want that, okay? So first I come up with a random R, just a random value, and I calculate a V prime, which is a variant of this, as V times B to the R, okay? Now what's gonna happen here when I do that? We'll see that in a little second. And then I reveal this V prime. Now, because R is totally random, this V prime is totally unlinkable with the original V. So when you see V prime, you cannot actually link it to this V unless you know R, but we're not going to reveal R to you. Okay? So these are unlinkable. I haven't violated my property yet. And now what I note is the following. If I rewrite all this, I can actually show to you mathematically that this would be equivalent to saying that C is equal to V prime to the E, G1 to the X1 all the way to GL to the XL, B to the S minus ER. Okay, and this just involves rewriting this times BR in terms of C, this C here. 
Okay, we just basically multiply both sides with this thing, okay, and it's all good. We'll actually raise both sides to the E and then multiply back on the other side. Now, this has a very interesting form. It is a public number, V prime, which I just revealed to a secret, E, another public number to another secret, X1, da da da, many of those, another public to a secret, another public to a secret. And I need to prove to you that C has that form. Well, that can just be done using one of these extended Schnorr proofs that I have shown you how to do before, because it's just a big number to a secret, 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 and I want to prove to you that C, which you know is public, has that form. So I can just use the Schnorr, extended Schnorr protocol that allows me to prove many secrets in order to then prove to you that C has that form. And if I can prove to you that C that has that form, then it must be the case that I have this V in that valid form, and therefore I have a valid signature, but I'm not telling you which one it is. Okay? Now this sounds magical, right? Because we're so attached to the fact that in order to verify a signature, of course I need to know exactly the message that was signed. Otherwise it won't check, right? Otherwise it won't check. However, here I have shown you a way to of course have not just one message, but many messages, as you pointed out, in a signature, and then prove to you that I have a signature without revealing to you either the exact signature that I was issued or even the exact messages. I can prove to you that I just know a signature on some stuff without even revealing you anything about the stuff. The only thing you learn is that, you know, the issuing authority has given me a signature. And then, of course, to make it interesting, I want to prove to you some more stuff than I'm older than 18 or that, you know, two of my attributes add up to something or something like that. Okay, are you at least convinced that this is possible here? I can see you smiling. I think you, you got it. Now, I have, of course, once you go tonight home, you will take my slides and you will not anymore be convinced. You'd be like, you know, at the time, this guy, he was maybe a bit charismatic. He kind of convinced me, but I now think it's bullshit, right? Really, I mean, this is not possible. I've convinced again myself it's not possible. And this is why I add the exact derivation of what happens if we rewrite things so that when you go home, you can indeed convince yourself that if we prove that this holds, then it must be the case that I have um, a signature of that form in my hands. And indeed, that should check at the end. Okay. Uh? <laughs> I did what? Uh, leave out several parentheses. Where? Well, the parentheses are not balanced in the first three lines. Yes. Oh, man, yeah, you're right. So this parentheses, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, uh, come on, g give me a break. I just forgot one as I was copying, <laughs> copying and pasting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I just kept copying the wrong line. It's not a big deal. You know, there is just one parenthesis missing after every B here. All right, good. So that's a, that's a good point. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's horrible, isn't it, right? I mean, there should be a PowerPoint thing that says you've made a terrible mistake. Where are the parentheses? Okay, cool. So as I said, the signature is based on an RSA assumption, and the assumption is just that it is impossible to find a V prime without knowing 1 over E, and we cannot compute a number to the 1 over E without being able to factor uh, the N into P and Q. If factoring is hard, this is hard, and that is that. The privacy of the scheme I showed you is just basically the fact that V prime cannot be linked to the old V because we multiplied it B times an R, which is unknown and then the privacy of the Schnorr signature, which I have convinced you through the simulator argument. So that is that. So now the full credential protocol is actually quite straightforward. Okay? The idea is that I get a CL signature on a bunch of attributes. So I go to my issuer. The issuer issues me with a signature in that form. Okay, fine. And then I, I go to my verifier. Okay, I blind my signature. Okay? And then I prove both knowledge of the attributes and also the relationship that I want to prove. I reveal some, et cetera, and I have basically a full credential scheme that has all the kind of properties that we thought at the beginning of this talk were impossible. Okay? So uh, this is it, really. Um, 
To be honest, we, we, we've seen a simple issuing protocol. We've seen a simple credential protocol that at least reveals some attributes, as well as a simple protocol that reveals some linear relationship within these attributes. We've seen that we can re-randomize the signature so that the issuer and the verifier, even if they are the same party, cannot tell who's being issued and the same person basically using the credentials. And we haven't actually looked at two topics, which I think are key to do slightly more advanced things. The first topic is transferability. How can you, if you're issued with an ID or something like that, not just give it to your friends so that they can actually do things on behalf of yourself? And we haven't looked at double spending. So if you're given a ticket, how do you also not give it to many people or use it multiple times and use it only once? This is particularly important if we use these schemes to create cash. Okay, because you don't want to be issued one coin and then spend it a hundred times. That's the worst thing that can happen. Um, that's the worst thing that can happen, in fact. Okay, so let's just uh, let our imagination run for a second. Where can we use this system? So first of all, when we do access control, in many cases, we actually want to check the attributes of whoever the subject is to see if they're allowed to access a resource or not. As we have seen in previous talks, role-based access control, for example, says, are you a doctor? If you're a doctor, you're allowed to access a, a particular uh, record, or are you a nurse, or you know, uh, whatever attributes, okay? So in this case, either if you have roles or you have particular attributes, you don't need anymore using these schemes to first identify someone, then link them to the attributes, and then let them go in. What you can do is you can say, prove to me that you're a doctor, or prove to me that you're uh, over 18, or prove to me that you have a particular role. I don't want to know who you are. I know that you have access. Here is your access. Okay, so you can use that to shortcut the authentication, fold it into the authorization, and only disclose a minimum amount of information. This is very relevant for privacy. This is also very relevant for very sensitive environment like military intelligence, blah, 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 where you want to make sure that, you know, you, you, have, um, you have authority, but you don't want to learn a bit more about that. Okay, the last thing you want to ask a spy is, why exactly do you have authority to access those files? Oh, it's because you did this operation and then that, and now you're involved in this other dodgy deal, you know, and you're selling illegal arms. Ah, therefore, okay, you know, you can do that. No, you don't want any of that. You just want them to prove that they have access and ask no more questions, and that's how you can do it. Federated identity management. You have many identity providers. You get basically some credentials from one or many of them, and then you can go to other relying parties and prove that you have some credentials and you convince everybody without revealing anything else about your portfolio of credentials. Cash, we already talked about this. Privacy-friendly identity, passports, etc. we've talked about this. And of course, I have presented multi-show credentials. And this is also the technology behind not just using this in order to do identity management and authorization, but actually using this in order to, for example, prove to your electricity provider that you are trying to pay the right bill without revealing anything else than the bill, or that you are actually paying your insurance company the right amount given the miles you have traveled and where you have traveled them without revealing where you have traveled and for how long. So all of these use the techniques that we've seen so far. I have some references, and that's the end of this talk. Any questions? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So the, um, okay, so the federated identity management side has been uh, in prototypes both in Microsoft and IBM. So Microsoft has a technology called Uprove, which was actually um, integrated at some point with some of the identity uh, management stuff they developed in um, uh, info cards and all these protocols many years ago. So this was taken away eventually, but Uproof still exists within Microsoft as a technology and is being pushed left, right, and center. Uproof underneath uses single show credentials. Okay, so you have to go get a, a bunch of them and then spend them one by one. Uh, IBM has a system called Edemix, which is exactly what I showed you, in fact. It uses exactly the CL signature. Jan Kamenisch is the designer of Edemix, and they're also having pilots at different uh, places to, um, to field it. Uh, Jab Henk Hopman in um, Nijmegen has implementation of Edemix and smart cards. So in theory, the whole, the whole scheme is there. Other places where zero-knowledge proofs were used were as part of the TPM, 
Um, I don't know how many of you went to, um, uh, to the talk about uh, the TPM yesterday. So the TPM had a remote attestation feature that allowed you to, to query the TPM and the TPM would prove that it's a TPM without revealing which TPM it was for privacy reasons. So it would say, I am a TPM, I have a signature that says I'm a TPM, but I'm not telling you which. That was also based on uh, this technology. Um, other um, particular protocols like this, we have, again, prototypes that do statistics, smart metering and all that stuff. This is related to the private computation, so it's another way of doing private computations if there is one party that knows that. They are, again, being prototyped in the Netherlands along with uh, the rest of the package. So these are just some industrial applications, but I think you prove an idemix are you know, the most mature systems out there. Uh, if you want to go and buy them, you know, they'll give you a quote, I'm sure. Yeah. Does that answer your question or any more specific? And then I can think specific examples and give them to you. Yeah? Is it possible to combine uh, credentials? So if, it were, if uh, one of the attributes on the credential were how much wealth you have, uh -huh. could I prove that I own more than 50,000? simultaneously with Nadina proving that she owns more than 100,000 in one proof proving that together we own more than 100,000. Ah, that's actually very interesting. So, um, no. Well, yes and no. So, it depends. Okay, so it depends what is your relationship. Okay, and what I'm... Yeah, that's exactly it. So, if you guys trust each other, for telling each other what your fortune is, and you want to then construct a joint proof, then we can do that. If, however, you both want to construct a joint proof and you want to hide from each other how much it is, that's harder. And I actually don't know how you would do it. The way you would do it is basically what you suggested. You would do a private computation and use these techniques to prove that the private computation inputs are indeed what your credentials say your fortunes are, and the result is correct, and therefore, that's your total fortune and it's over a certain amount. I wouldn't know how to do it directly using just zero knowledge because all the zero knowledge proofs, their efficiency comes from the fact that there is one party or one, one set of entities that know all the secrets. If suddenly now they don't, it's a very different game. Very different that game. That would be a strange thing to do, wouldn't it? Uh, to, to want to prove to a third party that you jointly own more, more than 150,000 if you're not willing to talk to each other about how you could guarantee that the proof would succeed. It would be like, you know, you'd have to start out the proof and then find out whilst you were trying to prove that it works or it doesn't work. Yeah, that's a good question. How do you know that you do before you even start, right? Uh, unless, you've got, unless you've told, yeah. And, and if you reveal it to each other, then yeah, yeah, yeah. you're back in the... Well, we, we might be comfortable okay. with revealing to each other that I am more than 50,000, but not how much more. Right. right. Yeah. So that's, yeah, I think, yeah, that, that, could, that could work. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thanks. The, uh, the slides will be available, I guess, as soon as. Thank you.